thank you so much, Fabrice. This was a very interesting uh, and very clear explanation of a tool that which aims which is extremely easy to use. So I guess it's very complicated to to uh, to to make it so easy and simple. Again, very sure. uh, dear participants, uh, welcome again uh, for those that uh, decided to uh, stretch the legs in this short break. We are now starting the the last session of for today. Uh, I am my name is Attila Gambardella. I work in DigiDepis in the Air Observation Unit. And uh, the focus of this, uh, the final session for today, will be Copernicus for the Arctic communities. We will show, we will have five distinguished speakers, and we will showcase uh, application for that uh, based on Copernicus and Earth observation and Earth observation data that can benefit uh, activities of people living in the Arctic. Our first speaker is uh, Til Soya Rasmussen from the Danish Meteorological Institute, where he works as a senior sea ice modeler. And, uh, as a, and as a primary focus is on the operational sea ice forecast. And given that Danish Meteorological Institute has obligation from Greenlandic waters, he will present us uh, uh, some work on this area. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you uh, for the introduction. Um, and can you share my slides, please? I can I can only see myself and you. Uh, yes, so I'm going to talk about uh, some of the obligations we have at the Danish Meteorological Institute. Uh, as, as Greenland is part of the Danish uh, Kingdom, we have obligations for providing ice services for these waters. Um, I'll primarily talk on talk about remotely sensed uh, services and, and outreach to, to the community. Uh, an important part of making these services is, of course, to understand what is needed and what is possible. Um, so first, uh, can you change slide, please? Uh, so Greenland is short. Uh, Greenland is a, a huge area uh, with a relatively small population of only around 50,000, where of these, uh, half of them are, are located in the capital, which is situated on the western part of, of uh, Greenland. Uh, the ice con conditions vary a lot around. Uh, there are areas with uh, multi-ice and, and ice covered all years, and then there are other areas where they are seasonally covered. Um, and, and on land, uh, there are hardly any roads that, that uh, connect cities, so, so travels on sea and sea ice is therefore an essential part of the uh, Greenlandic way of life and, and how they have been traveling all, at all times. Uh, obviously, it has not been feasible to, to provide remotely sensed image, images before uh, until the area of satellite images. So they've been living with the um, a, a sort of a climatology in, in mind, and, and but but with the. Uh, Climate changes that we experience. Some of some of these uh, climatologists has also been questionable. They can see that things are changing, uh, but they can't really say how and when and why. Um, next, please. The users are, are diverse. There, you have the local communities who hunt, fish, and travel. They are interested in in knowing when the ice is safe. To be on when when can they travel on the ice? Uh, they can do some shortcuts and and by by crossing the ice instead of going around the the mountains around the fjords. Uh, and they will often hunt and and uh, fish in on the land past ice, which which is uh, typically relatively flat. And in summertime, when there's no ice, they will use small ships to, to sail around the vicinity of the ice edge. And, and these users typically don't have a lot of bandwidth. They don't have a, a very big internet connection. 
uh, with cell phones, they, they are getting more and more connected, but it's not necessarily the case that they want to use this connection for, for safety information. Uh, as opposed to these, you have the last ship operators, and they would typically be able to, to download more as, as they need to have uh, Wi-Fi connections for all their guests as well, who, who wants to be on Twitter and, and all other things. Uh, so, so they typically have, have access to more data. They also have the ability of purchasing uh, services catered directly to them. Uh, and, and DMI is also producing these. Uh, however, in, in, in this presentation, I will focus mostly on, on the services that, that uh, are being provided to, to the general user. Um, next slide, please. And as mentioned, satellite has really provided a, a, a revolution to, to sea ice information in, in uh, remote areas such as Greenland. And uh, this is two examples of the SAR, of SAR images from, from the Sentinel 1B. Uh, sorry, A. Uh, 1B was unfortunately lost uh, not too long ago. And, and that, of course, reduces the, the coverage. Um, and, and these two images say something uh, you can see on this one. The top one is, is fairly easy to, to see where the ice is uh, to, to the west. This is in the western part of Greenland. You can see the red, uh, it's hard to see the red square, but um, but the ice cover is fairly easy, distinct from, from, from the rest in the northwestern area of the image. On the lower one, it's a bit more ambiguous. And, and uh, this ambiguity in, in SAR images um, makes it valuable with, with uh, trained uh, sea ice analysts who, who creates these maps. Um, and, and therefore, DMI and, and other institutions uh, are both uh, service up users and service providers of, of uh, satellite images and, and uh, analyzed uh, satellite images. Next, please. So this, this is an example from the southern tip of, of Greenland where, where ice charters uh, have a mosaic of, of SAR data. This is not just the uh, central one. It can also be accompanying missions. Uh, uh, and then they draw in a GIS uh, tool, the, the edge of the ice and, and the concentration as they see it based on, on these images. And this is then translated into to a, a, a final product, uh, which is distributed through uh, email to, to a lot of the communities, for instance, in the northwestern part in Karnak, where I showed the um, first images. They, they uh, download and print it and put up in, in the shores, uh, shops in, in the local town and in the local supermarket. So it's, it's a fairly low key way of getting data. Uh, and, and, but, but that has to do with the, the bandwidth. Uh, and, and um, Yes, next please. So as mentioned, it's, it's important to, to uh, to talk to the users and and the key message is uh, that a continuous uh, connection and, and uh, discussion with these are, um, are important. DMI has been represented in, in Karnak for many years due to uh, uh, different uh, uh, obligations we have up there. Um, and as part of a user uptake, uh, we were part of in four years ago, approximately with the Polo U, we did some surveys and we, we had a seminar, which is showcased in the upper left. And here they, they commented on, they could see that they are, the conditions of, of, of the ice was changing. And they could see that it was raining at times of year where it wasn't supposed to, um, but, but they couldn't really predict when and how and where. Uh, so, so we had the chance of, of uh, showing some some image, some satellite images, remote sensed uh, satellite images, 
And on the lower right picture is a lead that is uh, opened by, by iceberg. You can't see it in this image, uh, in this picture. But fortunately, there was a Sentinel-2 image that, that uh, where you could see the same image appear. And that really caught the interest. Um, but it, it's hard to make a service to, to a small community of around 800 people, which is, uh, which is not more automated in a sense. Um, so, so, so I think that's one of the key messages is that, that these, if you want to cater for all these um, local communities, then you need to automate your service to some, some level. Next, please. Uh, and, and the outcome of this was, was an app uh, showed in, in the lower left with the uh, sea inf information, both from, from satellite images, but also uh, Copernicus uh, forecast systems like the Arc MFC and, and the global MFCs. Um, when you go into these narrow fjords, it, it can be hard to have the resolution of, of it within the, the forecasts, which, which is often uh, in, in kilometer size, uh, they are more valuable in, in the in the um, open ocean and, and the, the near coastal areas uh, where they provide better information. Um, but but the satellite images were, were of use for them. Uh, next, please. In addition to the um, to the this app applications, uh, machine learning and, and artificial uh, intelligence uh, has also, uh, it's, uh, ice charts has been, been created based on these uh, techniques. And this is an example of where, where it shows that it's feasible based on a combination of, of SAR data uh, in, in two polarizations and answer two which is passive microwave that normally doesn't give any info if you get close to land. And it shows that the combination makes it, it better on to, uh, for the machine learning algorithm to, to learn about the um, conditions even, even closer to land. And, and the example here has the ice charts in, in the lower left, which is the, um, the truth, so to speak, and then uh, then the pure Sentinel-1 image and the Sentinel-1 image plus the Amstrad 2 uh, on, on the right. And, and you can see that the, the uh, combined uh, machine, the machine learning algorithm built on the combined data set uh, gives a much better result uh, compared to the ice charts. And this is a, a method which makes it possible to send individual images to, to the, the local communities um, and distribute them automatically. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't remove the need of ice charters as, as they are also needed to, to, uh, to sort of verify that the product is doing fine still. Um, and it's not just a black box we put things into. Um, so with these words, um, I would like to say thank you for your attention. And that was next slide, please. I think that was it. Oh, sorry, there was one more. Uh, yes, just to say that ice information is more than sea ice. There's also icebergs. And this is another one of the automated ice uh, products we do. That's more for the shipping partners. They, if they tell us where and when they're going. And then we send out uh, images like this one, um, which is based on, on Sentinel data uh, for this particular region. Um, and they are also interested in knowing where icebergs are and not just the sea ice. And that was it. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, uh, before moving to the next speaker, uh, just a quick um, practical information to the entire audience that uh, just to remind you that you can ask for a question and even ask a question on Slido using the Q&A tab on the top. Just because uh, I see that there is some, we have some action, but I'm pretty sure that curiosity, especially with this type of uh, subject might uh, be triggered even more. 
Uh, our next speaker will uh, tell us about uh, is, uh, is Andre Gunnarsson. He's a mechanical and civil engineer by training with a PhD in hydrological science with a specific focus on remote sensing. Since 2012, he, he is manager for a hydrological research at the National Power Company of Iceland. And today uh, will tell us about improving water resource assessments and forecasting in Iceland using remote sensing. Please, floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, um, so my name is Andre Gunnarsson, and I prepared a few slides on how the National Power Company is using remote sensing and uh, how we foresee some developments into the future using more of, of uh, the products provided by, by Copernicus. Um, so if I could have the next slide. So just as a, a brief introduction here um, about the energy system in Iceland, because it's, it's quite unique and, and uh, materializes a lot of uh, very specific challenges. So it's based out of 100% renewable energy sources. And uh, what this means is we have a lot of challenges in actually regulating um, hydropower or, 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 or wind because we have fluctuate, fluctuations both in uh, hydrology and, and when the wind blows. So it's uh, it can often be an uh, operational challenge to actually um, ut fully utilize the potential renewable energy has in Iceland. Uh, the majority of the power produced is, or over 80% is used in, in power intensive loads. So there's a very high base load criteria, meaning that the availability of energy from these renewable sources is very high, uh, meaning we need to have very good forecasting capabilities um, of, of, uh, of glacier flows or, or, or seasonal snow melting or, or whatever the case is in each, in each individual catchments. There are no interconnections. Um, this means that it, it, there are no ways of importing or exporting energy when we have, for example, poor hydrological years. Um, we, need to, we need to run or operate the, the power system as a whole in a way so we can meet all, the, um, all our contracts. Um, of course, yeah, there's the possibility of importing energy in the form of fuel, but really no infrastructure uh, in Iceland to actually utilize that in a, in a, uh, on, a, on, on, a, on a large scale. Um, the hydrology here is, is uh, so the majority of the inflow energy is, is from, from glacier ablation or glacier melt during the summer. Uh, more than 50% of, of uh, of the energy produced is, is from glacier melt. And we, we've seen very, we see a lot of variability in, in glacier melt um, between years. And about 15% of the inflow energy is, is from seasonal snow. So these are the two most important um, hydrological components. We, we invest a lot of um, information in, in actually um, understanding and knowing. So next slide, please. So uh, seasonal snow and glaciers are at the forefront front of, of what we try to understand in, in what we could call a near real time uh, perspective. There are a few timescales we operate by. So a short term timescale is, is mostly based on operational control of the system going from one day up to two weeks ahead of time. Um, then we also provide what we call outlooks. Um, or seasonal forecasts that go one to six months uh, ahead of time. And this is utilized in scheduling maintenance at different um, hydropower catchments, uh, but also to um, sell energy into short term energy contracts, which often are reflective, reflected of um, if we have favorable hydrological conditions to actually increase our, our energy production. Then we have a, a, a long-term time scale going somewhere in the range of three to five years ahead of time. And these, these are usually provided to uh, create medium or long-term energy contracts. And then we have uh, a scope which, which uh, tries to estimate future flows. 
so it takes into account um, how how glaciers are responding to to climate change or changes related to uh, precipitation and other governing factors there. And these horizons go all uh, up to 50 years uh, into the future, and they relate more to investments or refurbishment of, of older power plants or, or new power plants being built to actually facilitate an a increase or a change in, 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 in the general hydrology. So in from the operational perspective, which I would say covers uh, both the short term and, and, and the outlook, um, Horizon, we've been developing real time uh, products or information, and I will share a few slides with you which relate to snow cover, um, albedo of snow and ice. But there are many ways we use remote sensing. Um, a, a recent application is to estimate um, reservoir ice cover to estimate um, carbon release. Um, so we've been using, uh, we, we both operate our own. Um, forecasting system, but we also are using a lot of products from uh, ECMWF and, and uh, the Copenhagen services. So we've been developing many uh, methods or, or, or model improvements, so we can actually fuse together um, remotely sensed products um, with climate forcings uh, validated and calibrated by in, in situ data. So next slide, please. So uh, an example of uh, maybe an extreme here is, but this 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 shows us the eruption plume from Eyjafjallajökull in in 2010. Many of you remember this shutdown air traffic in in Europe for for a few days, but uh, in in the past 10 years we've had a few eruptions in Iceland, and if if these are these explosive tephra producing uh, eruptions, these can have significant impacts on how glaciers melt. Uh, and seasonal snow as well because of the meth enhancement or isolation due to the temperate deposits in 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 ice in in snow or or or, or glaciers. Next slide, please. We also have uh, these these uh, dust deposit events which we see very frequently um, during summer. So you can see the the where the source is in in. Uh, um, Proglacial areas we see there that the, the snout of of Vatnajökull, and these plumes will often um, blow over uh, glacier covered surfaces, uh, and you have dust deposits in the glaciers, and uh, you have a, a significant melt enhancement. So this is very hard to actually quantify in models, and this is one of the reasons why we we try aim at using remote sensing uh, more and more. Next slide. So it just shows how 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 it's on the ground when we have these dust storms in 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 the highlands. Uh, next slide, please. So what what we've been so mainly we've been using products uh, out of the uh, from the motor sensor so far, um, both based on snow cover because snow cover has a great impact on the surface energy balance and therefore the hydrology in in our catchments. But yet, yet as well, albedo of, of both snow and, and glaciers, because it's a modulator of, of the short wave energy force at the surface um, for meth. So we've created these uh, operational pipelines which ingest MOTIS data um, and create uh, gap filled products, uh, both using temporal aggregation, but as well machine learning models. So we end up with uh, fractional snow cover and, and albedo for ice covered surfaces, uh, which we can use in, in, in our operational pipelines. Um, <clears throat> currently, it's, it's based out of MOTIS since uh, MOTIS goes back into approximately the year 2000, but we're looking into uh, fusing albedo products from the size project led by Jason Box at, at at Geos uh, in, into these pipelines uh, since MOTIS will has an end, end of life in a, in, a, in a few years. Uh, next slide, please. So we can see in, in this case here, we see anomalies, albedo anomalies for um, for the for the from the year 2000 out through the meth season of 2022, uh, and red means we have lower albedo values, and and blue means we have higher, and you can clearly see. And if you go to the next slide, 
you can clearly see uh, in the eruption years 2010 when we had the eruption in Eyjafjallajökull and then in Grímsvötn in, in 2011, the extensive impacts this has on, on, on the surface albedo, which is directly translated into the, um, the melt energy uh, available to uh, provide or, or, or provide glacier melt. So these are processes that are very hard to um, to model unless you have a complex um, dust deposit uh, model associated with your work glacier forecasting models. Um, next slide, please. So here we have a, a, a cloudy cold summer of 2015 where uh, almost all, well, the seasonal snow was um, at the ground in the highlands. Um, very long into the summer, providing limited capabilities of actual actual dust dust to be deposited in in the glacier surfaces. Uh, next slide. And uh, and and maybe the next one as well. Yeah. So in tw in 2019, a dusty a very dusty summer associated with very early uh, melt out of seasonal snow in in the proglacial areas. So a lot of dust was transported to the glacier surfaces, impacting their meltwater production. And then for this year, we had a very localized dust event in July, uh, focused at the southwestern outlet of, of Vatnajökull, while the majority of, of uh, other glaciers in Iceland um, had very limited melt due to a very cold and, and cloudy summer. Uh, next slide, please. So what we've been been doing is is uh, testing uh, using these products in in a semi real time environment to reconstruct um, seasonal snow and glacier summer ablation. So we've been coupling together uh, climate forcings uh, produced daily here at the power company, uh, associated with um, remotely sensed albedo and fractional snow cover from Motis, and this gives us a meltwater daily meltwater estimation. Um, and so far has has a pretty good um, the validation results compared to observations are pretty good. So this is a very promising product uh, to actually uh, create both the short term forecasts, but yet as well um, the seasonal forecast, especially early in, in, in the mid season. Next slide, please. So we've been trying to integrate uh, remote sensing in, in, in part of our operational decision process. So it's not only based out of the uh, model domain, but yet as well fused with uh, remotely sensed products. Um, we are doing tests to um, use Sentinel-3 size albedo, which are quite promising. Um, this integration is, is uh, as well very very promising because we are able to capture events uh, such as these dust blowing events, or if we were to have an eruption, we were able, would be able to actually estimate pretty quickly what the impact would be. Um, so we we have we, we today we have it in in a real time configuration, so we can adjust the, our seasonal forecasts within the matter of of hours, and. Um, We've been testing it with uh, to do these um, uh, ensembles of seasonal forecast used using historical observations to predict the, the changes in the in the next few weeks or or or, or months. And uh, as an example here on on the figure, you can see meltwater anomalies for both seasonal snow and glaciers, uh, where red values indicate where we have uh, positive anomalies of snow. Um, and and blue values where we have meth below um, average, and and this is very helpful to actually uh, quantify or assess, um, especially on on a seasonal timescales of of what will happen in the next weeks or months or so. So I think that's my last slide. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Very interesting and inspiring uh, presentation. Uh, we are a bit late, so we will rush to the next uh, speaker. We have uh, Yannick Arnaud from the uh, EU Satsen. Uh, Yannick is an environmental scientist and with a master, um, master of Science on Geoinformatic Technologies. Uh, 
He has been involved in many research activities in different configuration. Uh, currently, he is project manager in the Cap uh, Capability Development Division of the EU-SATSEN, where he is responsible for the Copernicus uh, Support to External Action Service Evolution. So, uh, and he's involved in, in various external and inter uh, internal innovation initiatives. So, uh, we ha I personally have a higher expectation. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Atilia, for the introduction. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I will present today one of the examples uh, of the initiatives uh, uh, that currently we are working uh, in the European Union Satellite Center over the Arctic region. This is the ARCOS project, and its aim is to develop a proactive intelligence uh, platform uh, for institutional awareness. Next slide, please. I'm showing you here an historical picture. So uh, it shows a Russian nuclear icebreaker moving through the Arctic ice in a first transit of the Arctic Eastern Seas during the deep winter. This occurred in January 2021. Next, please. Uh, as you all know, uh, it is a fact that the Arctic is undergoing major changes in its climate. We have been seeing it doing all day. The poles of the Earth are more sensitive to climate change than any other region of the planet. So this is causing different effects in the Arctic. We have seen changing ocean circulation patterns, melting of the ice sheets and of the permafrost, and one of the most visible, which is the sea ice reduction. Next slide, please. This sea ice reduction is on the other side, gradually unlocking the strategic potential of the Arctic. Some international actors consider these changes to constitute, let's say, a great business opportunity for sectors such as energy, shipping, mining, and agriculture uh, to progress in, in this region. Regarding transport, new lanes like the Northeast Passage will give an alternative to the traditional southern route through the Suez Canal, representing 30 time percent time reduction. But this is not only about lowering costs and times, it's also making new resources available. In fact, uh, the Arctic is a very rich region in terms of natural resources. According to estimations, the Arctic will hold 13% of undiscovered source of oil and 30% of natural gas. It also contains important stockpiles of raw materials, fishing, forestry, etc. Next, please. So, uh, as we all are aware of, competition and geopolitical tensions are increasing. This is, challenge, this is leading, of course, to challenges in the security domain. On the one side, we have human activity, which is naturally increasing other traditional security threats, such as maritime accidents, illegal fishing, oil spills, smuggling, all these kinds of activities. But on the other side, Russia, being the nation with biggest economic interest in the Arctic, is quickly growing its military presence. Uh, they claim that this is necessary to protect their territory and assets. And the truth is that the Arctic has been a region of peace for almost 30 years, and now Russia is refurbishing their old Soviet bases, building new facilities, and investing in very large projects to extract oil and gas, like the Vostok oil project and, and others. Uh, next, please. Uh, in this slide, you can see, for instance, uh, the Nagurskoye, the Russian military airport on the left, and how uh, they started uh, building it, uh, building it up uh, almost 10 years ago, and how two years ago it was already finished. On the right side, we can also see how they are building from from scratch. Let's say uh, some air bases. Here is the temp uh, air base. Next, please. So of course this. This new, uh, this new context is challenging. It's very challenging and impacting already the environment and the local populations. It is amplifying the consequences of the climate change and accelerating the vicious cycle of climate change impact to the environment and so on. Regarding the European Union, as we have seen uh, uh, this afternoon by Jose Miguel Roncero Martin, uh, uh, there is a updated policy, an updated uh, European Arctic policy 
that already stated uh, the strategic interest for the European Union of the Arctic in terms of safety, prosperity, and of course also sustainability. But in order to reach such objectives, to protect the biodiversity and also the local communities, there is a real need on accessing accurate and updated information on what is going on in such remote and huge area in order to be able to take actions. Next, please. Uh, at, this, at this point, I would like to, to, to say a few words on the Copernicus SEA uh, service, one of the free Copernicus security services, which is an operational uh, service that provides just spatial uh, and intelligent information to uh, the European Union and its member states in a wide range of application areas that includes, includes rule of law, humanitarian aid, and crisis and conflict. It is a user-driven service, uh, and we assist the authorized users in enhancing prevention, preparedness, and response to crises by offering comprehensive approach for situational awareness and decision making. One example is confirming information or, or events uh, for our users. The Satsang has been entrusted to implement and operate uh, this service. And since the beginning of operations in 2017, more than 1,000 products and 500 uh, user requests have been received. Next, please. So through the service evolution activities and following the interest from many our, of our users in the region, we participate to the ARCOS project. So our ambition is summarized in four objectives. First, to develop a proactive intelligence system to improve situational awareness over the Arctic region by detecting anomalies over sea and land related to human activity. It will be an observatory with products and services relevant and adapted to a, secu a security community. Second, for a continuous monitoring of such large areas, we will rely on algorithms that will process multi-source data and combine it. The main data sources we use, for, we use, for instance, are satellite imagery, uh, but also combined with AIS data, social media analysis, uh, MONET, for example, portal, and other Copernicus data sets and services uh, as the one we have seen today, like the marine, the climate change, the in situ, etc. The third objective, as many uh, as you are already probably experienced and suffered in the past, is to overcome some of the talent uh, that working in, in such latitudes with remote sensing and earth observation technology uh, normally um, cause. Uh, this is especially true for us because we make an intensive use of optical data, so uh, the weather conditions uh, doesn't help. Finally, by the end of the project, the solution proposed proposed should be operational and ready to be transitioned into operations. Uh, next slide, please. So we consider that the Arctic can only be seen as a whole with a comprehensive and integral uh, approach. So for this region, we are interested in producing our reporting information relate, related to four domains. So we, we have classified, let's say, uh, uh, the information needs of our users around these four concepts. First, the Arctic Ocean status. Second, the land activity anomaly detection. Third, sea activity anomaly detection. And fourth, environmental protection caused by, by accidents and emergencies, let's say. Uh, next slide, please. So we are currently working to offer almost 40 services and products. They are all based on automatic or semi-automatic processing chains running in the background and in different uh, processing nodes. So each time uh, satellite imagery will be available, like a Sentinel-1 or 2 data, we will pre-process and run different analysis over it that could be, for example, artificial intelligence-based feature detection, analytical computation, like for instance, counting the number of features, and uh, then we will compare it with the normal behavior or perform chain detections analysis. So lastly, uh, some conditions, if some conditions are met, uh, there is an alert system that is put in place in order to uh, alert the users on, 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 on these animal anomalies or particular events. So I will not go through all these products and services, but uh, as an example, we will detect uh, constructions work. Uh, we will be targeting 
uh, we will be detecting and identifying moving tar targets entering a pre-configured area of interest. And we will also identify the operational status of industrial facilities in order to detect changes. Next slide, please. Um, I have to say that uh, this is still a work in progress, so uh, we will finish by mid-2023. Uh, yeah, but uh, the development of the platform is already advancing at good pace. Uh, and I will, you, uh, I will give you um, already today some of the achievements that we have reached. Uh, so first is proactivity. So our users are interested in receiving information in quasi or in, even in real time. Of course, it's not always possible, but uh, such an early warning system goes in that direction, in the sense that it alerts them as soon as we identify an event or a particular um, activity. In addition, uh, this platform is custom customizable, so the users will be able to subscribe, depending on the area and the service they are interested in, in order to receive alerts and afterwards uh, access the different products and services. But they will, in any case, be able to ask to set up new services over new areas of interest, uh, according to their interest. Next, please. As I advanced, we aggregate multiple space and non-space data sources, and we reuse information from other Copernicus service, services. So the idea, of course, is not to duplicate or redo uh, work that uh, has already been done, but better to uh, focus on tailoring that information to the use, to the particular needs of our users. And of course, also to combine different data sets that are already available in order to create new information. So uh, we are also moving from delivering data to providing information and analytics ready to be digested and consumed by, uh, uh, by our users. So for this purpose, we use the dashboard concept in which we combine uh, different sources of information in form of graphs. Uh, we can also integrate uh, information or, or snapshots of saturated imagery. Uh, and this way can be more meaningful than the classic just partial viewer we are, we are most used to. Next slide, please. We are, of course, also uh, running in parallel, very, uh, performing analysis at very different scales. So uh, I'm giving here some examples on how we detect pollution peaks in vast areas related to human activity. This way, for instance, we detected new Russian uh, facilities related to, to the oil extraction. Uh, and we also use, as I say, a, a more narrowed down analysis. In this case, we detected the construction, construction works in a liquefied natural gas plant um, that occurred during the, the last year. Uh, next slide, please. Just here before, before finalizing my, my speech, I wanted just to, to give uh, some numbers of uh, this project, which is uh, funded under the Ocean 2020 program. It is, is, it is being done by seven partners, EGEOS, COE, GMV, the Finnish Nat Meteorological Institute, ISAI, Politecnico di Milano, and Satsen, uh, with a budget, a budget of one million and a half funded by European Commission. And as I said, we started in December 2020, and uh, we plan to, to, to have it already by June 2023. If you want to have more information, I'm giving here some, some uh, 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 links to the project page and also to the SEA, uh, to the Copernicus SEA service. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Eric Malnes. He works at the Norwegian Research Center in the Earth Observation Department. Eric does research in satellite remote sensing and focuses uh, on application on Earth observation within cryosphere climate research with particular attention to snow, avalanches, and surface water monitoring. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you.
Okay, um, I will present the results from uh, the EU project uh, Kepler that uh, did an assessment uh, of the <clears throat> and the requirements for remote sensing uh, services for reindeer herders. Next slide. So Kepler uh, ran from 2018 to 2021. Uh, it was built around the operational European ICE services but also on the Copernicus information platform providers. Uh, we uh, provided a roadmap for the Copernicus program to develop industry and societal driven value added technologies and products for uh, and other services uh, with a focus on the polar regions. <clears throat> Copernicus uh, maintained uh, extensive contact with the stakeholders to develop use cases where Copernicus could play an important role. Next. Uh, uh, among other things, we, we had these uh, workshops with the indigenous people. Uh, these are the people, uh, the, the Sami people uh, living uh, far north in uh, the Scandinavian peninsula uh, in the countries Norway, Sweden, Finland, and also in Russia. Uh, and we discussed how satellite services could be adapted to the indigenous way of life. Uh, uh, what they um, maintained uh, very important is that uh, we respect the traditional knowledge, the TEK. Uh, uh, we discussed with them ideas and possibilities for satellite derived downstream services. Uh, and uh, the main response from the the people was that uh, several services could uh, indeed be important for reindeer herding. Uh, but reindeer herders uh, need also access to ser the services uh, with their cell phones uh, and pre preferably also adapted to the Sami language. Uh, of uh, very high importance uh, is also that uh, we respect the, the uh, indigenous people values. Uh, this could be, uh, for instance, a uh, potential for land use conflicts. So it is of a, a major importance that we, we do not cause more problems. Uh, the image is from a workshop we had in Inari, Finland. Next slide. So uh, in addition to the workshops and the, the discussions with the, the, with the indigenous people, we also did a survey of the the relevant uh, uh, parameters that we could uh, could be of importance for for uh, from remote sensing, uh, and we provided the recommendations for the future evolution of Copernicus. Uh, we also analyzed parameters that can be acquired with the future missions, such, such as Simmer, Crystal, and Rosell, and all of them have a big potential for polar regions. Next slide. Uh, for instance, uh, for uh, uh, we have a list here of uh, land parameters. Like, uh, uh, of course, uh, in situ me measurements are not uh, satellites, but uh, but um, many regions across uh, the Arctic is uh, fully covered by by meteor data. So more automatic stations are desirable. Uh, for uh, for uh, with respect to the to the remote sensing data, we we think that snow cover uh, could be improved. Existing services rely mainly on optical data, which uh, have a problem during the polar nights, uh, usually from uh, uh, um, November to late February. But uh, using uh, SAR data. For instance, uh, both uh, Sentinel-1 and uh, upcoming ROS-L, we could improve uh, the snow cover monitoring. Uh, snow avalanche uh, is uh, a problem in many uh, uh, Sami <clears throat> places. And uh, uh, for instance, the, the Norwegian snow monitoring uh, or avalanche monitoring service could be extended and provide uh, relevant information to to Sami herd, uh, 
reindeer herders. Uh, soil moisture uh, is also uh, relevant, and uh, it, uh, but it should uh, uh, be improved for uh, for uh, freezing thawing conditions. Uh, research and uh, uh, pro future products from Rose L could improve uh, soil moisture estimates uh, in the Arctic. Uh, snow depth and uh, snow water equivalent that could it is currently measured with a passive microwave with a very coarse resolution, but uh, at least Rose L could improve the, the, the estimates uh, dramatically. Lake ice, uh, we, we have uh, currently uh, an, uh, a service in, in Copernicus using optical data, but uh, as uh, said before, uh, they are unuseful in, uh, during the polar night period. Uh, so Sentinel-1 could uh, improve the situation here. Uh, we also have uh, heard about uh, permafrost earlier uh, today, but and uh, it is hard to measure. But uh, for instance, Rose L could provide improve improvements. Also, some uh, maritime parameters are relevant for uh, for reindeer herders, such as fjord ice products. Next slide. Uh, here are some of the services we discussed with the reindeer herders. And we, for instance, uh, river ice mapping could be important to, to have information about that during, during the migration of reindeers from winter to summer pastures. Also, wet snow mapping uh, could be useful. And of course, uh, avalanche detections. Uh, but uh, uh, the reindeer herders uh, emphasize that it, it is very important that the, uh, the service is available via cell phone and, uh, of course, in, in real time. Yeah. Next slide. So this is uh, um, um, kind of a, it's uh, some uh, cuts from a movie we made, but uh, and the, and the idea is to have a rain, reindeer herders app where reindeer herders can access uh, meteorological forecasts and satellite information in the field. Next slide. And uh, based on the information uh, obtained in the app, we envision that the reindeer herders can select the uh, the best route from the summer to uh, from the winter to the summer pasture. And back again, of course, in the fall. Uh, and uh, by by doing that, they can avoid many problems such as avalanches, uh, uh, dangerous uh, lakes, crossings, and and so on. Next slide. So in, in resume, uh, Kepler have engaged indigenous uh, stakeholders to analyze the need for satellite services. Uh, and uh, they can be improved in polar regions uh, in several contexts. An integrated service, uh, preferably app-based, app could be useful for reindeer herders, in particular along the migration routes. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have our final speaker, Ms. Uh, Chiara uh, Solimini from the USPA, where she joined recently after a more than 15 years career in space private sector and the European Space Agency. Uh, Ms. Solimini, uh, Solimini pardon, uh, holds a master's degree in environmental engineering and a PhD in geoinformation, and she will tell us about use space improving uh, life and operation in the Arctic. Please, floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I think. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to give you an overview of uh, USPA activities, uh, especially related to, to the Arctic. 
Next slide, please. I would like to give you a short overview on USPA, who we are, what we do, and the activities that are related to the Arctic and polar regions. We are a quite new agency with the new regulation and expanded mandate. We embrace all the different components of the space program under one umbrella, including Galileo, the Global Satellite Navigation Positioning System, EGNOS, the Augmentation Service, Downstream Uptake Activities for Copernicus, GovSatcom for Secure Satellite Communications for EU Governmental Actors, and very recently, Space Situation Awareness. Next slide, slide please. We use the same integrated market user-driven approach for all the different components of the space program. This approach is based uh, on met well-established methodologies uh, based on three pillars. Uh, market user knowledge, we perform market technology monitoring and forecasting. For example, we publish uh, uh, the Earth Observation GNSS market report. Uh, we perform uh, user consultation platform, which is an event that uh, occurs every year. Um, every year and we gather user needs and requirements uh, uh, from different user communities, uh, mainly uh, focus on commercial actors. Uh, regarding the second pillar, we support uh, the demand uh, using uh, extended key account management with main pay players in the different uh, uh, value chain uh, in the different market segments. We also support the offer creation, the creation of new made in Euro products, uh, implementation of end-to-end -end solutions through uh, proof of concepts and demonstrations. And we also support entrepreneurship, SME, and startups. Next slide, please. Regarding uh, the first pillar, I mentioned the uh, Earth Observation GNSS Market Report. Uh, we published this report uh, in January. Uh, there are uh, several, a lot of information, let's say, uh, in this report uh, related to market intelligence, uh, uh, market forecast, uh, and it, it encompasses uh, 17 market segments. I would like here to select uh, some market segments that are relevant to the Arctic regions, uh, such as uh, biodiversity, ecosystems, and natural capital, maritime and inland waterways, and climate services. Next slide, please. Here, I would like to give you uh, a snapshot of the information you can find in the report. Uh, in this case, uh, for the biodiversity, ecosystems, and natural capital market segment, uh, you can find the revenue for, uh, from Earth Observation Data and Services sales uh, by application. You can see that the applications that are contributing the most uh, to the revenue of this market segment are uh, terrestrial ecosystems monitoring and snow and ice ecosystems monitoring are mainly earth observation based ap application and the contribution from Copernicus is very relevant. Uh, Sentinel's data uh, from Sentinel 1, 2, 3 missions are uh, contributing to this segment, but also Copernicus services such as Copernicus Marine Service, Copernicus Land Monitoring Service, and Copernicus Climate Service. Next slide, please. Regarding the user consultation platform, as mentioned before, we are going to hold uh, this year um, consultation platform on the 3rd and 4th of October. The registration is open. Uh, this year, related to the Arctic, we are going to have the maritime market segment with application including uh, uh, ship route optimization and sea ice navigation. The output of this consultation uh, are uh, reports, user requirements reports uh, and uh, this will be uh, these reports will be published uh, for market segments it will be public uh, um, and also some priorities uh, for future research and development program will be addressed during the user consultation platform uh, next slide please 
Uh, I would like to mention that we also uh, support startups uh, uh, through, for example, competitions. Uh, one of those is my youth space competition. The objective uh, is to stimulate innovation in Europe with the development of commercial solutions uh, such, such as mobile apps, uh, wearables, and robotics using youth space data, especially from Galileo and Copernicus. Uh, we have two tracks in this competition, the track one from uh, idea to prototype and track two uh, from prototype uh, to commercial solution. Uh, the next edition of my space competition uh, is going to, to open soon. Uh, next slide, please. I would like to mention that last year uh, we had a solution that was related to pitland restoration, combining data from EO satellites, drones, and ground sen sensors uh, to provide actionable insights into the current uh, condition of peatlands. Uh, you are going to have uh, uh, more details on this solution tomorrow uh, in the startup uh, uh, pitch session. Next slide, please. Another initiative we had was the second Cassini Hackathon uh, related to, to the thematic pr protect the Arctic with European space technologies. Uh, there were three challenges uh, in the framework of this Hackathon. Safe passage at sea to design products, uh, devices or services uh, that enable container ships, cruise liners and fishes, uh, boats to navigate safely across the North Nordic seas, uh, life on land, uh, more related to uh, services uh, and products uh, enabling human societies, plants and wildlife to better adapt uh, to the Arctic climate. Uh, and finally, uh, the last uh, uh, challenge was related to ca caring for our wildlife, uh, to design products and devices or services uh, to help protect uh, biodiversity and the natural habitat in the Arctic. Arctic. Next slide, please. The winners of this hackathon um, were uh, uh, pro uh, developing some solutions, for example, uh, for, to tackle Arctic soil erosion. Uh, this solution uh, uses satellite imagery to create a searchable map that identifies locations with a high risk of erosion. Again, you are going to have more details on this solution tomorrow during the startup pitch session. Uh, another solution called Polar Bearings was related to a AI based uh, polar navigation platform uh, providing optimal routing for terrestrial vehicles in the Arctic and ice blink uh, to support the navigation, including ice detection for vessels in the polar seas using remote sensing technologies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I would like to mention that we also have uh, opened uh, the Cassini Maritime Prize. Uh, this prize uh, uh, is to develop uh, data-driven marino maritime digital application uh, for the detection, monitoring, and the removal of microplastics, uh, plastic liters uh, uh, from coastal zones, rivers, and shores um, using Copernicus and or Galileo data in combination with other data sources uh, uh, and also using AI, HPC and other big, big data processing uh, um, workflows. Uh, unfortunately, plastic uh, has reached the Arctic regions. So I think this is could be very relevant. Uh, next slide, please. Another activity I would like to mention is, is related to the Copernicus demonstrators. Uh, was a procurement that closed on the 2nd of September. Uh, the uh, focus of the procurement uh, was the demonstrator, uh, the demonstration of six innovative proof of concept uh, to develop end-to-end -end solutions in the user operational environment. Um, this procurement was divided into lot, lot one mobil mobile mobility emergency infrastructures and lot two uh, consumer and environment. Uh, next slide, please. 
in in lot two, uh, there is a proof of concept three, which is related to autonomous navigation and ship route optimization. Um, applications in this uh, uh, proof of concept uh, uh, are related to firmware monitoring service and navigation through CIs. Uh, I think that, that it, that's it. Basically, that was my last slide. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, to all the speakers of this session, I politely ask you to switch on your video because uh, I see there is uh, already a few questions in the Q&A. And actually, uh, there is uh, one that which was, it's there, it's waiting there for a while, 53 minutes ago. I think it's, uh, I'd like to start with this one, and uh, it, which is, how local stakeholders and local organization can contribute in Copernicus Polar Research. I see that already TIL has, uh, has started providing an initial uh, uh, comment, reply. I don't know if you want to add anything else, or maybe if I, if I maybe I will be curious also to, to hear uh, Eric in, in the what and about this and uh, in, and how from the experience of the um, Kepler activities. Uh, what, what did you, uh, if you have anything to to provide on this in this input? I see a particular question to Andre. It's uh, very specific. Maybe, maybe later, uh, I, but I don't see Andre. Let's see. And uh, actually, there is also another point. Is if you look at the poll. There is a question that it's uh, addressing that we are addressing the audience, but maybe also you might um, might contribute. Is how could Copernicus improve its ability to provide useful services to local communities? Some of you already had provided some uh, very useful hints, but uh, this will help us to close and wrap up this session. And then, although with a bit delay, we can close the discussion for today. So who wants to start? Uh, I can start uh, with regard to the um, uh, indigenous people and how they can uh, help improving or demonstrating services. It, it's, um, it's very clear that, uh, that uh, such a, <clears throat> or uh, one of the, or the service we, we uh, design, uh, described could be very helpful for, for Sami people. Uh, uh, and reindeer herders, but uh, but of course it it's uh, it's neither a national nor nor a, a kind of a pan-European service. So so far it hasn't uh, been very clear where we could uh, find the funding for such a service. But but of course that uh, that could be um, uh, well. I I think it it would be a wonderful service for the for the reindeer herders to to have such a app available so let's see in the future if it can be realized uh but thank you so much uh is there anyone willing to share some thought about this so, yeah I, I can say a little as i started responding to it um one thing that came to my mind is that the canadians they have a smart eye service where they train the locals to to uh uptake the the data, uh, the services, and, and include them in, in the development of this. And that might be a way of uh, getting services out to the, to the locals. Also, when you don't have the uh, time as a national institute to provide services from in very local spaces. Uh, very well. And, uh... How you see the role of Copernicus and remote sensing in general in uh, in order to facilitate life in the Arctic? Clearly, uh, what I can what what I can see is that uh, changes in the Arctic, mainly due driven by climate by the changing climate, are happening at a pace which is much faster than never happened before, and local communities maybe don't have even the enough time to adapt because 
as a every human being, I think it's capacity to adapt is one of the reasons why we are still here on this planet after so much time. But the pace of the change in the Arctic are really uh, maybe unprecedented. Is uh, clearly uh, what I see that Earth observation is the capacity to reach, uh, to cover, to map, or to monitor very large area, also remote. Is there a, a, any aspect that a remote sensing that can also should emphasize we should invest more or should be better um, exploited to support life to help life of all uh, Arctic communities. If I may try to to respond to your question, uh, I think I, 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 it's a very generic answer, but probably we have the capacity to provide facts and to provide real information, accurate information on what's going on. Uh, related to, to the topic of, of my presentation, uh, you know, there are very huge uh, exploitation projects ongoing on the Arctic that will extract oil and, and gas, uh, mostly driven by, by Russia. Uh, local communities have been said, you know, that uh, it will provide them a lot of, of jobs, or a lot of resources and, and, and different, you know, uh, of course, we, we all want uh, this kind of, of services of well-being of schools or of, of uh, um, health services. And they have been uh, in, in some way, you know, they have been said that they will receive all these, uh, let's say, if all these projects are, are developed. But the truth is that, uh, for instance, Rosneft and, and this kind of uh, exploitation uh, projects so far are producing like uh, I read the other day, but more than 3000 oil spills and, and, and pollution events, you know, in the Arctic region. And on the other side, they are not creating not a single job because they, they are just engineers that are coming from very far away and, and, and just once they are finished, they will go go away again. And what I try to say here is, you know, it, it's very easy and we have a lot of disinformation. We have a lot of narratives on the table uh, and this kind, you know, of technology of products of services open. Uh, in our case, you know, it's not open because it's for authorized user only, but uh, talking about the Copernicus program, uh, we have the capacity of, of, I will say, counter you know, uh, counterattack with with real information on what's going on, and, and well, this is this is my my comment. Okay, thank you, um, Eric. I see your uh... yeah, one point that I I I was uh, discussing it briefly in the presentation that uh, it is very important to respect the 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 culture of the uh, indigenous people, and for instance, this. Uh, there was a presentation earlier on where where uh, it was about counting, for instance, reindeers. And that's actually very challenging, and it's it's uh, you can compare it to someone doing remote sensing to to uh, to count the money you have on your bank account. It's it's not uh, <laughs> very well liked among uh, Sami people. So so we we have to be very careful, and I think uh, actually what what we need to do is to pay uh, some of the uh, reindeer herders to to use uh, and uh, develop uh, contribute to develop the services. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I see that uh, it's already uh, we already passed uh, uh, six p.m. Uh, if there is no uh, and I see that. We more or less covered all the questions that they were in the in the in, in the slide. I'd like to close the session here. I uh, I think uh, allow me to thank you for this very interesting and inspiring uh, speech. I personally learned a lot, and this is I think it's uh, one of the things that I appreciate more in this type of uh, activities. Uh, Again, uh, Maria, I'd like to give the floor back to you, the word floor back to you, and uh, I think we are ready to close the day. Thanks, Attilio. Uh, this has indeed been a very packed and interesting uh, day. Thanks to all the speakers, uh, the moderators, uh, or invisible uh, Slido moderator, Thibault, 
thanks to the organization team. You have really worked uh, very hard and, and well today, uh, or communication team. And of course, thanks to the audience. Um, I hope to see as many of you as possible uh, tomorrow at um, two o'clock uh, for day two um, of this workshop. And uh, I'd also like to mention that the presentations from today uh, are already available at the event site. So yes, thank you all and see you tomorrow. <laughs>